Many of you are well acquainted with our introductory tune and song and praise the Lord today that we have got a story to tell and we're so thankful for the messages that we share and the message that the Lord has given to us for you on our Glad Tidings, our program. And on this special day, as we come toward the Easter season, and this is, of course, Palm Sunday, we are going to share with you a program that uh, relates to that historic event on this special day. So we're going to commence with one of those great and notable hymns that is usually sung this day around the world, Ride on, ride on in majesty. And it is Mildred Rainey singing it for us just now. Ride on, ride on in majesty. Hark all the tribes, Hosanna sing. O Saviour meek, pursue thy road with and scattered garments strode. Ride on, ride on in majesty, in lowly pomp, ride on to die. O Christ, thy triumphs now begin, or captive death and conquered sin. Ride on, ride on in majesty, the angel armies of the sky. Look down with sad and wondering eyes to see the approaching sacrifice. Ride on, ride on in majesty, thy last and fiercest strife is nigh. The Father on his sapphire throne awaits his own anointed Son. Ride on, ride on in majesty, in lowly pomp, ride on If you've got a Bible, of course, you will know that the records of this day's events long ago in the land of Israel are recorded right there in the gospel messages. And my message later in the program will be taken from Luke's gospel, chapter 19. But also before we come to that, we've got Yvonne to share with us some background to these great hymns that we usually sing at this time of the year. But before she does... We're going to have our good friend Anita MacDonald from Scotland to sing Open Up Your Arms of Love. And it will lead us into Yvonne's message and storyline for you today. So the Lord bless you as you listen to us in the coming moments. Bid me enter in, for I have claimed you as my Lord, who cleansed my heart from sin. I lean on your unending grace, your mercy, love, and I lift up your name and give you thanks for your presence here with me. Open up your arms of love and bid me enter in. For I Who 
cleansed my heart from sin when you obeyed the Father's will to die upon the tree you took my filthy rags of sin and you gave new life to Your arms of love and bid me enter in for I have claimed you as my Lord who cleansed my heart from sin now I come to you today my Lord to worship and adore I ask for strength to walk with you both now and evermore open up your arms of love and bid me cleansed my heart from sin I rest in the hollow of your hand in your protective care I have assurance in your word that you are always near Open up your arms of love And bid me enter in For I have claimed you as my Lord Who cleansed my heart from sin Yes, I have claimed you as my Lord Who cleansed my heart from sin Who cleansed my heart from sin This is a season of the year when we give special attention to Christ's suffering, death and victorious resurrection. One of my favourite Easter hymns is King of My Life and the chorus goes, Lead Me to Calvary. It was written by Jenny Evelyn Hussey. Now Jenny was born into a Quaker family on the 8th of February 1874 in Henniker, New Hampshire, where she lived most of her life. She was a daughter of Paul and Sarah Hussey. Much of Jenny Hussey's life was spent caring for her helpless invalid sister, but Jenny wasn't known to complain or to grumble. She displayed a cheerful personality, even though from middle age onward, she herself suffered debilitating rheumatism. She began writing poetry when she was just eight years old, and her first poems were published when she was 13. Three years later, she began writing children's stories for magazines. When she was 24, the first of her 150 and more hymns was published. Lead Me to Calvary is by far her most famous, still sung today in many churches. The Quaker movement, also known as the Religious Society of Friends, was founded in the 1600s by George Fox, who was a mid-17th century English Protestant reformer, who was imprisoned several times for his beliefs. In fact, he suffered eight imprisonments between 1649 and 1673. He was imprisoned for blasphemy in Derby 
1650, when a judge mocked his exhortation to tremble at the word of the Lord, calling him and his followers Quakers. The Quakers had a rich heritage, but were not interested in worldly power or wealth. They encouraged each other to find spiritual union with the Lord. They worked hard for the betterment of society, caring especially for the poor. William Penn, who gave his name to the colony of Pennsylvania, was a famous Quaker. As well as promoting social justice, he wrote a devotional book called No Cross, No Crown. As a fourth generation Quaker, Jenny Hussey would have read Penn's book. We can see it in her hymn, Lead Me to Calvary. First, crowning Jesus King, and then being led to the cross of Calvary. Perhaps she was sounding a warning to her fellow Quakers and to all Christians not to get wrapped up in politics, organisation and good deeds, forgetting the loving sacrifice of Christ. She repeats the phrases, lest I forget, and lead me to Calvary. In verse 3 she wrote, let me like Mary, through the gloom come with a gift for thee. With the writer we join Mary in the garden to witness the empty tomb. But Jenny probably has in mind the other woman who came to the empty tomb carrying the spices, as well as referring to the Mary who had previously anointed Jesus' feet with expensive perfume in Simon's house in Bethany. Both incidents are appropriate here. The hymn has a sweet aroma of love and devotion wafting through the song up to heaven. Lead Me to Calvary first appeared in the hymn book New Songs of Praise and Power in 1921. It is one of the church's best loved hymns of aspiration. These thoughtful words can deepen our spiritual lives as we move through the week coming up to Easter Sunday. Unlike many other hymn writers, Jenny Hussey remained anonymous, living all her life on the family farm in rural New Hampshire. She obviously did not seek glory for herself, but gave it all to Jesus, who was the king of her life. Although not Quaker practice, she asked to be baptised in her later years. She explained to the minister that she had been hidden away in the country most of her life and before she died she wanted others to know that she loved Jesus. She died on the 5th of September 1958, that's the year I was saved, age 84 and was buried in a Quaker graveyard in Henniker, New Hampshire. Let's listen prayerfully to the words of lead me to Calvary now. Thine shall the glory be, lest I forget thy thorn-crowned brow. Lead me to Calvary.
Many times when we gather together with God's people, just before we celebrate the breaking of bread or communion service on a Lord's Day morning, that would be a hymn that's quite commonly sung before we share fellowship together at the communion table. And praise God today for the beauty and the sacred wonder of those words. And we just trust and pray today that you will be led to Calvary. I remember many, many years ago, a young man came to our church services and it was his first time in the church. And I had referred to Calvary, but he had no idea what Calvary was. And he asked afterward to some friends and people, what was the word Calvary and what did it mean? And I trust today that you know about Calvary, that you know that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came from heaven's glory to earth's sin and sorrow and shame, to live and then to die and be crucified on a cross in a crucifixion death, and by that crucifixion become an atoning sacrifice for you and for me, that we might be reconciled to God, that we might be forgiven from all the guilt and shame and sins of the past, and thank the Lord today for Calvary. Have you been led to Calvary ever in your life? Have you been to the cross by faith? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior yet? Today might be the day. And then, of course, as we come through the Passion Week that's now to follow this Lord's Day, when we come to Friday and we come to next Lord's Day, you will be celebrating your first Easter in Christ. And thank God for such an experience. Now, let's read together with you from the New Testament Scriptures, and I'm reading, as I've already intimated at the introduction to this program, I'm reading from Luke's Gospel, chapter 19. The reading commences at verse 28. And when Jesus had thus spoken, he went before, ascending up to Jerusalem, and it came to pass, when he was come nigh to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him, and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, Why do ye loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way, and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. Amen. And ending our Bible reading there at verse 42 of Luke's Gospel, chapter 19. May the Lord bless his word to all our hearts for Christ's sake and glory. 
Now shall we pray together before we come to God's Word today? Our Father, we thank you for the changeless message of the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you today that though you were so majestic, the eternal Son of God, you humbled yourself and became obedient even unto death, the death of the cross. But even on the way to Calvary and on the way to the cross, we see something of the meekness and the majesty that made your character and your person and was evidence to all. Lord, we pray that you will speak into our hearts and lives today through your own precious word. We pray in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. My message title today is, Here Comes the King, taken from the Bible reading that we have just had and the words that you find in the Gospel record, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That was the acclamation of the people and exclamation of the crowd on that great day. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. It has been the tradition of the church over a period of many centuries to mark the Sunday before Easter Day as Palm Sunday. The event is commonly referred to as the Triumphal Entry. Speaking of Christ's entry into the city of Jerusalem and the beginning of the final week of our Lord's earthly ministry after three and a half years preaching, teaching, and working so many miracles in the community and serving his heavenly Father. Each gospel writer highlights this event, giving us a complete record of the day and the events that followed that day in and around the temple. The time has come for the execution of redemption's plan. The purpose of Christ's coming into the world is about to be fully revealed. The shadow of the cross intensifies significantly at this point, but for the masses who gathered around there was no expectation of such an event. These people had a coronation in mind, not a crucifixion. So let's join the procession. Perhaps you have been to the land of Israel. Perhaps you have been there a number of times and you have walked down the road on the slopes of the Mount of Olives and you have ascended perhaps from the Kidron Valley and the Garden of Gethsemane and you have perhaps walked up that road. Generally, we walk down it because it's a steep, uh, a winding pathway. But we've been there a number of times. And even as I speak to you today, I've got a picture in my mind's eye of that event so long ago. In the record that we read, we have, first of all, the adulation of the crowd. The news that Jesus was coming to Passover traveled like wildfire. And you can feel the excitement as you read the account because it says they took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna! Blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. This was the only public demonstration that our Savior, the Lord Jesus, permitted during his public ministry. But it was the fulfillment of the prophet Zechariah's words. And what did he say? Well, listen to the words. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. That's in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. And even though it was written hundreds of years before this event happened, yet it was fulfilled to the very letter. The aspirations of the people were at fever pitch. The one person who could deliver the nation from its Roman occupiers had arrived. They were looking for someone to champion their political cause. The people of today are increasingly looking for someone who will champion the cause of freedom from the manifold troubles that are gripping our world. 
when I was just a young Christian, over 50 years ago, I remember a European uh, spokesman, a political spokesman saying, what we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all people, to lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man, and be he God or devil, we will receive him. Think about that. That's a way back half a century and more ago. And those words that were spoken back then are even more imminent to be fulfilled in the days in which we live. The euphoria that was evident on that day on the Mount of Olives, on that road down through the slopes of Olivet toward the Kidron Valley and up toward the temple area of Jerusalem, that euphoria would not last very long. When these people discovered that God had a different agenda. It was not a season for a coronation, but it would become a scene of crucifixion. Now, in general, the Galilean followers of Jesus were more accepting of him than the people at Jerusalem. And so some say there is a difference between the people who greeted him on that day and the people who shouted, crucify him, crucify him. But that may be a matter of conjecture, and you may uh, have a different interpretation on that. But all, in some way or another, were looking for a coronation, not a crucifixion. And when it came to the point that they realized that he was not there to be a political deliverer for them, we read these words, Away with him! We will not have this man to rule over us. Perhaps today you're amongst the people who likes to heap adulations on the Lord Jesus Christ as if he was some very great person, a wonderful miracle worker, some great deliverer, a good man, and all of that. But the lowly Christ who is willing to go to a cross and to suffer and die for your sin and mine, no, I don't want this man to rule over me. Perhaps you're like those people. Secondly, in the thought today, we have the lamentation of the Saviour because we read these words in verse 41. And when Jesus was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. If you've ever walked down the slopes of the Mount of Olives, you will come to a place called Dominus Flavit. And from there, you look across the Kidron Valley at the city of Jerusalem. And tradition has it that here is the place where Jesus wept over the city. The exact place is not important, but the explanation of the Master's grief is very significant. Listen to these words. If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things that belong to thy peace, but now they are hidden from thine eyes. Why did he say that? Well, he could see ahead. He could see the total destruction of the city that was coming. He could see how these people who had a long history of turning away the messages of God's servants, the prophets, would come to a day of great sorrow. He knew that they would now reject the greatest offer of mercy. And John in his gospel says right at the beginning, he came unto his own and they received him not. The Lord saw the coming destruction that would leave the city a mass of flattened rubble. Worse still, he foresaw the indescribable suffering that was coming down the road for these people. No one would escape, not even little children. His anguish and flowing tears mingled with his lament is found in the words that followed and just at this point in my reading at the end of it, thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. The sad and tragic fact is that here is a reality that is being played out every day in our land, 
and in your land, wherever you are. Man has become more rebellious, more anti-God, more pro-sin. And as we draw near to the end of this age of grace, God-given opportunities to repent and seek salvation are being spurned by the multitudes. And it may be that I am speaking to individuals just now who have had many opportunities to get right with the Lord. You have had warnings, interventions, invitations, but still you carry carelessly onward to a Christ rejecter's eternity. And if you could only get a glimpse of the yearning heart of the Savior, waiting for your response, you would not delay. How important it is to hear again these words, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. There is a third thought in the message today, and that is the interrogation by the disciples. In Luke chapter 21, we read these words. Immediately after a succession of events in and around the temple, including cleansing the temple from the religious uh, traffickers, uh, counteracting the taunts and trickery of the chief priests and the Pharisees, and observing the humble widow placing her two mites in the offering box, Jesus and his disciples retreated to the Mount of Olives for the evening. Now it was time for the disciples to get some clarification on the Master's future. And what were his plans? Matthew and Mark also give their accounts of this greatest prophetic discourse. It's called the Olivet Discourse. Matthew chapter 24 and 5, Mark 13 and Luke 21. Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? What follows is a striking description of the world we find ourselves living in just now. Jesus speaks of counterfeit messiahs, national and international conflicts, and widespread persecution. And they are not new phenomena, but their prevalence and intensity will be more pronounced as this age draws to its climax. It was Thomas Campbell, the English poet and teacher, said, Coming events cast their shadow before. Yes, indeed they do. We are looking at the deepening shadows of a greater turmoil not far distant. Primarily, this was a message to a Jewish audience with relevance to a Jewish application. But there is no escaping the worldwide impact of all that Jesus Christ spoke about. And woven into these end-time scenes, we have the reality of the return of Jesus Christ. Yes, there is a day coming, a day coming soon, when the trumpet will sound, and those who belong to Jesus Christ will be caught up to meet the Lord. He is coming. He's coming as the bridegroom for his blood-washed bride. Oh yes, he came to Jerusalem and he was rejected. But the next time he comes, he's coming for his bride. He's coming for his people. And I ask you, are you ready for his return? Are you sure that you're born again? Remember that Jesus said, two shall be together. One shall be taken. The other left. And so he continued on, speaking to his disciples. But the time of catastrophic events on a global scale and a period of relentless anguish and tribulation is sure to follow. We are living in perilous times, but we haven't seen anything yet compared to what's yet to come. And so it behoves us to be ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. And so these events played out in the few days that followed this triumphal entry. And I just put them in there so that as we lead up to the weekend to come, that you will have not only a picture of the event as we celebrate today, Palm Sunday, but of the next few days and how he shared with his disciples what was yet to come and yet to be. And I trust even today, 
as we think about this, and perhaps you would take your Bible and read these gospel records during this Passion Week, let me say in conclusion that Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago was just a dress rehearsal for the day when Zechariah, the same prophet as we spoke about earlier on, told us that his feet would touch the Mount of Olives again. And the next time he touches earth and rides into Jerusalem, it will not be to a crucifixion. It will be to a coronation. He will set up his throne and establish his kingdom. And they will look upon him, the Jewish people, they who pierced him. And this time that I'm speaking about, they will crown him as their king. Every knee will bow to his authority. Yes, the adulation of the people. Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. The king is coming. But it wasn't the king that they were prepared to accept at that time. Maybe today he's presenting himself and you're not prepared to accept him either at this time. You want to reject him. Take heed that it doesn't pass you by and the opportunity to take him as your Savior be gone forever. And then there will be the lamentation, not only the lamentation of your heart that you have missed a God-given opportunity, but the lamentation of the Savior that you did not come, though he was inviting you and longing to save you and make you his very own. Oh, yes, there came a day after that when he was interrogated by his disciples and told them what would happen. And as we listen to the words that he shared with them and look out on our world today, we can see that we are closer to the Lord's return than we've ever been before. And we need to be ready for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. Now, next Lord's Day will be a very special day in the church calendar on a special day in history. That is Easter Sunday, when we celebrate the resurrection of the Savior who was crucified. Oh, my dear people today, may the Lord write his word into all our hearts and help us now today to open up our hearts and say, King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be, lest I forget thy thorn crown brow. Lead me to Calvary. I thought that a fitting song for our concluding message today would be a song by a lady here from Northern Ireland, May Crooks, and she's singing, I'll see you again. It is a message that is built around the words of Jesus Christ before he took his departure from them. I'll see you again. And yes, one day we shall see him. And what a glorious day it will be for those who know him. But every eye will one day look on him, either as the Savior or the Judge. Which will it be for you? I pray the Lord will write this song into your heart and into your spirit. When Jesus was speaking to doubting disciples concerning his mission to die for our sin, he told of his death and returned to the Father.
Well, praise God and thank you so much again for those who have shared on our program today and the message and the thoughts that we have left with you. May they be a challenge and a blessing to you in Jesus' name. Eric Stewart saying bye-bye and God bless you.